You know why no one seems to really care about what researchers have to say? It's because they're too multidimensional, too nuanced. They offer a picture that is just not extreme enough. And people need extreme. People need extreme. Hi, I'm Marine, and I'm also a marine biologist. And today I'm going to review sea spiracy. I spend most of my time researching issues that pertain to seafood fraud in the supply chain, and I also look at methods to try and tackle illegal fishing around the world. So as you can imagine, I'm pretty eager to watch sea spiracy because this is my trade. That's what I do. This is literally what I devote my life to. Alrighty, let's go. I'm a bit nervous, to be honest. Good old Netflix. I can feel this is this is gonna go all wrong. Clearly the beginning is all rosy and I I know that in about one minute it's all gonna go to shit. Slaughter, then there's no market for dolphin meat. Why not just release them back into the sea? And the answer to that question is pest control. The fishermen view the dolphins as competition. The fishermen see the dolphin as competition. That is uh, something that definitely has happened with other organisms in the past. I'm not really familiar with the dolphins in that region of the world. There has also been culling of other marine organisms because they are viewed as competitors. In Norway, for example, they've done that with the seals. And this is, you know, this is not something that happened just at sea. It's also something that has happened on land. That being said, I am a little bit skeptical, skeptical about the fact that they don't eat their meat. Um, if you do a bit of research, you can see that dolphin meat is definitely consumed. Eating dolphin meat is not really recommended because it's full of pollutants but people still do it in some parts of the world. Like bluefin tuna, shark populations were crashing with species like thresher, bull and hammerhead sharks losing up to 80 to 99 percent of their populations in just the last few decades and it was causing other unlikely species to die out with them. Over the period that we've been monitoring... It is very true that sharks have seen a dramatic decline over the last few decades. Based on some recent study, it's more in the ballpark of 70%. But like, even if that's like a little bit lower than what he actually says, 70% decline since 1970 is, is massive. It's a massive decline. And it, it is largely attributed to fisheries. When it comes to fisheries, it's a little bit tricky. It's also true that a lot of the sharks are caught as bycatch. They're not necessarily targeted. Because the shark finning industry is strictly held in Asia, whereas everyone around the world is eating fish. That's not true, by the way. The shark finning industry is not strictly held in Asia. I refer to bycatch as the invisible victims of the fishing industry. The industry will call bycatch accidental take, but there's nothing accidental about bycatch. It's factored into the economics of fishing. Uh, this is um, not uh, completely correct. Bycatch is definitely accidental. There are definitely some species that have value, like sharks, uh, that tend to be caught as bycatch, but a lot of the species that are caught as bycatch have no value whatsoever. And as they just said, like five minutes earlier in the documentary, they're put back into the ocean most of the time dead. It is not something that fishermen usually want. And sometimes it can actually be really damaging to their nets. All our cotton bugs and plastic bags are, are swirling around in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. 46% of it is fishing nets, discarded fishing nets, which are far more dangerous for marine life than our plastic straws, because of course they're designed to kill. Now this is so crashingly obvious. Why aren't we talking about it? Why aren't even the plastics campaigns talking about fishing? 
Um, this is... Okay, there are many things here to say. Just go on Google and Google ghost nets. And you will see that NGOs have been talking about fishing nets and fishing net plastic pollution for years. The reality is that a lot of the plastic is consumer plastic. And it is obvious to me why this is what NGOs focus on, because this is what you as a consumer can change. Most stores now in a lot of Western countries don't even sell plastic bags anymore. So like, don't start telling me that NGOs have done nothing but talking about plastic straws. So Jackie was saying that one of the ways to tackle the massive problem of fishing nets in the ocean is to say no to eating fish. But I was wondering why you haven't put that important message on your website. A consumer message to eat less fish? Yeah, it's not my area. It's not my area of focus. I hear you. Yeah. I don't have time. We have an event. Can you turn off the cameras? Thanks. I'm not interested in focusing there. I don't have an opinion about that. It's just, I was talking about what people can do to make a difference about fishing and trash in the ocean, and Jackie said we could eliminate or reduce fish consumption, and I asked if that was a good She didn't day. say to eliminate fish, I know that she didn't. Is uh, eliminate or really, really reduce your intake of, of fish. She did. She didn't say she eliminate fish. fish. This is, this is making me so sad. I really... I don't understand what he, why he's he's framing these NGOs like that. It's just okay. Let me just give you, you know, a little bit of of, of background here. It's true that in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, there is about fifty percent of the plastic that is coming from fishing nets. However, you can't extrapolate what's happening in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to the entire world. And these percentages are not true when we're talking about the plastic that exists in the entire world. About 80% of the plastic comes from land, and about 20% of it comes from marine sources. And out of that, about half of it comes from the fisheries industry. So the fish industry globally makes up for about 10% of the plastic pollution. Of course, NGOs should talk about it, and they do. Again, just Google ghost nets and you will find lots of stuff about fishing nets, plastic pollution. And the reality is these NGOs spend their entire freaking life trying to solve these issues. How is this fair? It's very hard for me not to get angry about this because this guy has been working on this for maybe maybe four years of his life and then he'll move on to something else. These NGOs are not going to move on to something else. They will continue working on this. It's very sad. It's very sad to frame them like this and it's really unfair. Although I finally felt like I was on the right track, I couldn't help but feel frustrated that the constant media and global attention on plastics and fossil fuels we're distracting from an industry we hear almost nothing about with a much, much greater impact to the sea. I, I don't think it's accurate that we hear nothing about the fisheries industry. You need to dig a little bit if you want to hear about these issues. The, the, the NGOs talk about them a lot. And you can find a lot of information about fisheries, about overfishing. You can find lots of documentaries about it and lots of books about them. I've got a book on my shelf right here about it. Here, let me take it. Here, this book, this book, oh, sorry, <laughs> this, is, this is not going to help you, is it? This book, The End of the Line, oh, it's probably upside down. Anyway, The End of the Line by Charles Clover. This was published in 2004. So anyway, the point is, we've been talking about fisheries for years. This has led to global fish populations in some cases plummeting to near extinction. But perhaps one of the most shocking facts of all came from one of the world's leading fisheries experts, estimating that if current fishing trends continue, Twenty forty eight. When it comes to this particular value, after a lot of debate in the community, the authors actually ended reviewing this, and in a paper that they published in two thousand and nine they offered a much more nuanced and less dramatic view of the future. So it, it is widely accepted now in the fisheries research 
community and conservation community that this value is just wrong and no one uses it anymore. There are some recent studies that have been published about the status of the world fisheries and I'm gonna put the link the links in the description below. Well, using your economic analogy, today's oceans aren't only in debt, but they're in a major depression. Shouldn't we just stop spending what we can't afford? Obviously, we cannot go to the other extreme and say the only solution is not to fish at all. We cannot, I don't think we can do that. But your government are taking extreme measures to ban single-use plastic when fishing causes far more destruction. So why is the fishing industry getting special treatment from this? Yes, for me, the idea is not to stop fishing. For me, the idea is to do more sustainable fishing. To do more sustainable fishing. More sustainable fishing than doing more of something that isn't working. This is just very wrong. Sustainable fishing is most definitely possible. It's not some crazy conspiratorial myth or anything. There definitely are some some standard definition of what sustainable sustainability is in the fishing industry. So for example, one of the metric that people use in the fishing industry is called the maximum sustainable yield. It's basically it's an it's a number um, that um, tells you how to 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 maximize the amount of fish that you're taking out of the water and also maximize the amount of fish that you will have the next year. And to put it really simply, the idea is to have the same amount of fish from one year to the next and make sure that they never dec decrease. The MSY is a metric that is used throughout the fisheries industry. So this is why I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit surprised that the Oceana representative didn't mention it. When it comes to the interview with Oceana, I don't, I, I'm gonna put in the description below a link uh, where you have a response from Oceana. It is a, a f I don't know, 30 second snippet interview taken out of, uh, of a two hours interview that he had with this woman who is a former employee of, of Oceana. I think it's very sad, again, that he takes, you know, the bits that are convenient for him so that he can conveniently frame people into, again, this grand idea of conspiracy. This is how I'm going to describe it to you. Think about it this way and try to think about it in, a, in an, <laughs> an open mind. People like Paul Watson from The Sea Shepherds want the world to stop eating fish, okay? And that's, you know, that's good. I kind of want that too. I mean, I don't eat fish. I'd be happy if no one else ate fish. However, it is completely unrealistic. The world is not going to stop eating fish. You cannot live in this utopia thinking that people will stop eating fish. First of all, there's a lot of people who depend on fish for their livelihood. And second of all, there's a lot of people who are just not going to stop no matter how much you put this into their face. So this, this thing that Paul Watson says is his utopic world. The problem is it's, it's not really an advice that is useful because we know it's not going to happen. On the other hand, you have NGOs who take a much more realistic approach, which is okay, well, the world is not going to stop eating fish. We know that. So what can we do? What we can do is provide consumers with the necessary information to try and choose at least the less damaging fish, right? So we're gonna look into fisheries that are sustainable because they do exist. There is sustainable fisheries out there. And we will let people know which are these fish and these fisheries that are sustainable. And if they really wanna keep eating fish, at least they have some information at the tip of their fingers. Hi, um, this is Editing Marine. I just wanted to let you know that um, this actually video is getting a little bit long, so I decided to divide the review into two parts. Please feel free to share this. I think um, I, I'm very disappointed that there is no interview of researchers or fisheries specialists in this documentary, and because this is kind of what I do, I think it offers a a little bit of nuance and an alternative op opinion, which which I think is really missing from the documentary. So uh, feel free to share if you think that this might be helpful or, or with, you know, if you think this is interesting. 
Um, I just want to make it clear that I'm not trying to play the devil's advocate in general. I do think that in this industrial commercial fishing is it can be very damaging and um, and 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 there's a lot a lot of problems that uh, still need to be addressed. But I also do think that there's quite um, a number of things in this documentary that are misleading and. I just wanted to make sure that this was um, touched on because it is very one-sided. So this is my take on things. And as I said, uh, part two will be coming up very shortly. So thanks so much for watching. And if you have any comments, feel free to uh, feel free to comment. Feel free to tell me what you think as long as you remain respectful, please. <laughs> Bye.